So in this lecture, we're going to look at this generalized function, so-called generalized function called the unit impulse function. And it's going to serve as a derivative for the unit step function. Uh, this, I think, was first used by Oliver Heaviside. It's also associated with the physicist Paul Dirac, sometimes called the Dirac delta function. But the inspiration for it essentially comes from classical mechanics. That's where the, this term impulse, in this sense, originated. So let's take a look at Newton's second law. Newton's second law, often written F equals ma. Since momentum in classical mechanics is m times v, mass times velocity, uh, and acceleration is just the derivative of uh, velocity, we can also say, write Newton's second law as F equals the derivative of momentum. So um, if we solve this uh, simple ODE, which we can do simply by integrating, for a given applied force, F of t, maybe I should write this the other way around to be more consistent with our usual notation. For t equals zero, we simply get t greater, greater than or equal to zero, we simply get that P of t is uh, the integral from zero to t of F of tau d tau plus whatever the momentum was at time zero, or zero minus, let's say. So this means that the change in momentum that occurs from zero minus to t is just this integral from zero minus to t of f of tau d tau. So if you're just interested in the change in momentum, p of t minus p of zero minus, all that matters is this integral of the force. So there are many possible values of f of t, many possible sort of force profiles that describe the way the force changes with, with time that can give rise to the same integral. It doesn't really matter how f varies with time. As long as it gives uh, the same integral, you will get the same change in momentum. And in fact, it doesn't really matter what t is. So in other words, over what interval of time you have to integrate. If you get the same integral, then you'll get the same change in momentum. So for that reason, this integral of force over time is referred to in classical, classical mechanics as the impulse that is being applied to the particle in question. So change in momentum equals the impulse integral of force over time. And again, it doesn't matter how long the time interval is. If the integral of the force over that time interval is the same, you'll get the same change in momentum. So what you can do is imagine keeping the impulse constant, keeping that integral constant, or if you like, keeping the area under the curve constant, but making the length of this interval shorter and shorter. In particular, it's convenient to um, make a sort of idealistic assumption and let the length of the interval become arbitrarily short.
So suppose we're considering a given impulse. And we're going to apply exactly the same impulse, but we're just going to let the duration over which that impulse is applied get shorter and shorter. The idea of a unit impulse function is essentially that of delivering an impulse of one, hence the term unit, over zero time. So if you like, a unit impulse represents a kind of spike in force in this case, in the mechanical case, but it's a spike that is uh, of zero width and therefore of infinite height, uh, but such that its area, the area underneath the spike, is one. So in the mechanical example, this is like giving an infinitely swift kick to your particle. So over an interval of zero length, you deliver a non-zero impulse. We're going to represent the unit impulse uh, using the symbol delta t. As I mentioned before, it's sometimes called the Dirac delta function. And again, this isn't a real function. It can't possibly be because it would have to be an infinitely high spike of zero width. So it's not defined in the way functions are normally defined. Uh, in fact, it's defined uh, solely in terms of its integral. And that's true of all of these generalized functions, but we'll only talk about the unit impulse. I put integral in quotation marks because, I mean, it's not a real function, but we treat it as though it is a function whose integral from a to b is 1 whenever a is less than 0 and b is greater than 0. So again, this represents a spike of zero width. And uh, implicitly we're saying here that this spike arrives at time t equals zero. So as long as you integrate from some negative time a to some positive time b, you are integrating over the entire duration of this spike, which is in fact a duration of zero. And in that case, uh, your integral will give you the total area under this spike and we call it a unit impulse because we're saying that its area is one. And this is in fact the reason why in many of our integrals we start our integration at zero minus. We, we take this right hand limit as the lower limit of integration approaches zero because we want to capture um, any impulses that may be contained in our function. So you can think of it as being defined this way. Um, so what this means, therefore, is um, for any uh, integral from a to b of delta t, 
sorry, I should have had a dt in there. Yes. Um, this integral from a to b of delta t dt can be written as u minus 1b minus u minus 1a. And this will give you 1 as long as b is greater than 0 and a is less than 0, in which case u inverse of b will be 1, but u inverse of, u, sorry, u minus 1 of b will be 1, but u minus 1 of a will be 0. So you'll get 1. But these aren't the real way we uh, define the unit impulse. The actual definition is what is commonly known as the sifting property of the unit impulse. So for this, assume that we have some function f of t, which I'm just going to say is suitably well-behaved, maybe having a Laplace transform. And suppose we integrate from minus infinity to infinity f of tau delta of t minus tau d tau. Okay. What happens when we perform this integration? Well, again, delta of t minus tau is an, a spike of zero width intuitively. And because delta of t represents a spike that occurs at time t equals zero, if we shift it by writing instead delta of t minus tau, this is a spike that occurs when t is equal to tau, or tau is equal to t, in other words. So wherever tau is different from t, this spike will be zero, because it, again, it's a spike of zero width that occurs when tau is equal to t. So if tau is different from t, this will give us zero, and therefore the entire integrand will be equal to zero. So all that matters is the value of f when tau is equal to t. Okay. Whenever tau is different from t, this factor, delta of t minus tau, is going to be zero. So in fact, we can write that this is the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f of t, delta t minus tau d tau. I'm speaking intuitively here because what I'm actually working towards is the, the real definition of the unit impulse function. Now, f of t doesn't depend on tau. And we're integrating with respect to tau. So we can take f of t outside the integral sign. So what we end up with is f of t delta of t minus tau d tau times the integral from minus infinity to infinity of delta of t minus tau d tau. Now, if we're integrating with respect to tau from minus infinity to infinity, then we are definitely going to be integrating over the spike, which occurs when tau is equal to t, this finite value of t. And we know that the area under this spike is equal to 1. So this is just going to give us 1. So in other words, if we take any reasonably well-behaved function, multiply it by this impulse that occurs when tau equals t, multiply f of tau by this spike that occurs when tau is equal to t, and integrate with respect to tau from minus infinity to infinity, we will just get the value of f at the particular point t at which this infinitely narrow spike arrives, the spike of width zero arrives. So taking this integral picks off, if you like,
the value of f of tau at tau equals t. And it's for that reason that this property is called the sifting property. And this is the actual definition of the unit impulse function. It's this function delta of t minus tau that has this sifting property. This is the actual definition. that defines this unit impulse function, or Dirac delta function. Okay. So, that's probably enough for this video. That's the only generalized function that we're going to look at. It is defined by this property, the sifting property. And in the next video, which I think will be the last one for this week, we're going to look at the Laplace transform of the unit impulse function. And this Laplace, the value of this Laplace transform will follow immediately from the sifting property. So I'll see you in the next video.